of you who don't know our uh, speaker this morning and tomorrow morning at 10, uh, Dr. Nate Lau is uh, a member of our Linear Church. And, uh, well, he's married to Sarah's, one of Sarah's daughters. Does that help identify him at all? Nate Nate, who's Sarah? Very involved. <laughs> And uh, he's, his uh, doctorate is in education. He's been a principal and school administrator and still is in the alternative uh, schools for uh, kids that get kind of kicked out of the school system. And, and it's a ministry they have. But one of his passions is creation and uh, biblical creation specifically. And so to this morning and tomorrow morning, he's going to just let loose on why that makes a difference to your faith. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate having this opportunity is um, uh, like you said it's a passion of mine this is not my training or background but it's an area that i've studied my entire life kind of as a hobby and a side thing my dad was a science teacher and uh, took us out to the grand canyon and did uh, the ice, old icr trips with us and looked at rock layers and those types of things so from an early age this was in my blood way before the creation museum how many have been there by the way have you been to the creation museum uh, way before Ken Ham, or in his early days of uh, <coughs> researching and, and looking at all of this. So I love the, uh, the study of this world and what God has to say about it in his word. And uh, that whole debate, uh, I've been um, a student of that my, ever since I can remember. What I'm not going to do today is get into the science. I'm not going to try to recreate what Ken Ham does. I'm not going to try to um, uh, explain evidence and why, why we should believe this evidence or why we should view the evidence uh, through this lens, a biblical lens. Um, I'm going to leave that to uh, Answers in Genesis and, and I subscribe to this magazine. I would encourage you to get some of those resources if you don't have them, especially if you have kids in your home. They're great uh, tools for us to have them. What I want to do today, since I only have today and tomorrow, I have two hours, and I have about um, 15 weeks of material, um, is I really want to focus on, so who really cares? Uh, what's the big deal about whether or not God created the earth as it says in Genesis, uh, what's the big deal about the time frame that he used? Um, how does that really affect my life? Because I hear Christians say, uh, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. Um, I believe I'm going to heaven when I die. I don't really want to get into that debate. I don't really care how we got here. The point is we're here and we've got to... Um, we, you know, we got to live this life and uh, make the best of it, and, and try to figure out this life that we're in. And I don't, I don't really care if we were, you know, if it's been 13 billion years in the making to get to this point, or if it's been about eight or ten thousand years to get to this point. It really doesn't matter. And I would contend, and what I'd like to show to you today is that this does matter, and. Um, when I look at the Word of God, and we're going to look at it today and tomorrow, I'm, I want to spend the majority of our time, so hopefully you have your Bible or an app or something that you can look at in a notebook. We're going to look at Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 2, specifically a little bit into 3, and we're going to look at Revelation. And the reason that I'm dividing it this way, um, a thought came to me that Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega. And I've never really spent a whole lot of time thinking about what that means. Um, that, that he's the Alpha and Omega. And then I started looking through scripture and, and seeing different words that remind me that he is the beginning and the end. And the ten our tendency in the Christian world as I look at this, we want to avoid... Genesis, because it's pretty controversial, and people get all bent out of shape about it, and they get angry, and Bill Nye, you know, the science guy, 
you know, gets up and has a debate and all of that. So we kind of want to avoid that. The other book we kind of want to avoid in the church, oftentimes, other than when Roger does a beautiful job explaining uh, end times, is Revelation. We kind of want to avoid that book. Most of us probably this morning, if you spent time in the Word, didn't spend time in either of those books. I'm guessing. Did anybody? Okay. One person did. All right. My wife. Thank you. <laughs> One fan. Proud of that. Most of us avoid these books because we think, all right, we got it. You know, and even Genesis 1, if we like Genesis, it's usually the Moses and the Exodus and, and those biblical stories. We don't spend a lot of time in Genesis 1. And I want to do that this morning in a, min in a few minutes here. It is critical to have these bookends of the Bible and actually to see how they mirror each other. He's the first and the last. He's the author and, and finisher or perfecter of our faith. He's the conception genesis, by the way. The word genesis means conception. The genesis of this idea, the genesis of this company is its conception, it's its beginning uh, and the culmination. There's, there's something happening in the end uh, that has a point, and we need to know why that's going to happen and um, be prepared for it, and that determines how I live my life. The Creator and the Judge. Where do we, where do we, um, let's just talk about these two words for a minute. Revelation or Genesis, do we see judgment? Chapter 1. Well, uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, we think of judgment happening in Revelation, right? And creation happening in Genesis. Both are, are there. There's creation, recreation in Revelation. There's judgment in Genesis chapter 3. Judgment on this earth. And then the flood judgment a couple chapters later. These two concepts go together, and they're critical for our understanding of the entire Bible. Um, I was, I was, um, let me jump ahead to this slide. Most of what I need to know about the questions, the big questions of life, I learn, I understand from the first three chapters of the Bible, or the last three chapters of the Bible. Most of the information about things like this, I wrote some of these things down, about God. Who is God? What are some of the attributes of God? What is my basic understanding of God? I get from Genesis 1 through 3. About me. My origin, my identity, my image, reflection, my purpose come from primarily Genesis chapter 1 through 3. About this world. How it came to be. When it came to be. The purpose of this creation and God's beautiful design about heaven, about sin, and God's feelings about sin, all come from the first three chapters of the Bible and the last three chapters of the Bible. You see his wrath towards rebellion against his law. About work and rest. My concept, a biblical concept of work and a biblical concept of rest, come in the first three chapters of the Bible. About a relationship with God and His Son Jesus and the importance of that. About marriage. Another hot topic, right? My concept of marriage is laid down in the foundations of this world when the, the designer of human beings and the designer of human relationships set the parameters for what marriage is. I cannot ignore this design. I cannot ignore, and it's uh, it's being debated in our world and in our church. Churches, church basic. About Satan and his role in this world. I, I get an understanding of him as a deceiver in the first three chapters and the last three chapters of the Bible. So what's the point of the rest of the Bible? This is where we spend the majority of our time in understanding and reading and, and Bible study. The rest of the Bible is narrative of God's redemptive plan for the people and the planet he created and historical evidence of his continual desire to be Emmanuel. What does that word mean? God with us. In the beginning, you see, and we'll look at this, God 
desire to be with man on this earth. It's so opposite of any other religion or any other desire to please a God. It is God's desire to be with us instead of man's desire to try to reach up to God. We see continually throughout Scripture, beautifully laid out, even in the end, God's desire to be with man on this planet that he created good and well. That's why we need the rest of the Bible. It explains all the stuff in between. Your worldview can be laid down in the first three chapters and the last three chapters, and the rest of it is God's attempt and God's narrative of him working with individuals and working with groups of people to bring him back to his desired intent. Think of this world, think of humans as a machine that were designed by God, and he's saying, here's how this machine should work. I'm, I'm, this works best. This works for your joy when this machine is used in this way. And this is how this is laid out. So these are some of the things that knowing the first three chapters of the Bible and the last three chapters of the Bible that I can explain to my kids, because I have kids right now in the ages of 6 and 14 who are asking these questions. They see things on the news, they hear things on the radio, they hear things at school, public school, they see their friends going through things, sometimes bad things happen, sometimes good things happen. There's incredible design as we look around this world. They want to know. My seven-year-old wants to know why. How does this work? How does I can either? I, there's basically two ways that I can get these answers. One is a biblical definition of of these things, an explanation of how these things work. The other one is a naturalistic worldview, or a, a worldview that says um, and, and um, there is no God. There is no supernatural. And all of these things came about by natural means. Those are your two basic options for how to explain life to yourself and, and to your kids and all of these things. And there's many more. I just picked out a few. So that's what I want to look at today. And specifically, well, you'll see some of this. These three questions. These are the big three questions that everybody on the planet has an answer for. Whether you're an atheist, whether you're an evolutionist, whether you're a Calvinist, whether you're a Baptist, whether you're a nothing agnostic, everybody has an answer from a kid five years old has an answer to this question to a person before they die. Where did I come from? Why does that matter? Let me just throw it out there. Why is it? Why does it matter where we came from? Yes. Because if you're just going to you by way of the zoo, there's no hope. You have been the creation. <laughs> I'm a family member. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. It's an amazing place. It gives us hope, right? If we know where we came from. Yeah. That's good. Your origin, just think of your parents, your family, determines your identity. Right? The color of your skin, the language you speak, attitudes towards life, God, the church, race, homosexuality, all of those things are determined by your origins, either by your genetics or by uh, the environment that you live in. The same is true for our origins as a human race on this planet. Our origin determines our identity. If, if my origin is God, that says something about who I am, about my identity. If my origin is evolution, or goo, or animal, if I'm part of the animal kingdom, if I'm a hominid, if that's all that I am, is an evolved hominid that determines some things about my identity. It determines some things about the way I respond to life and people and situations. Origin is critical for 
identity. Just like somebody who has been adopted, maybe. They, they typically, a lot of times, someone who has been adopted want to find, they want to know their story. They want to know their birth parents. They want to know how it is that they came to be. Because there's something within us that wants to know our origin. We, because we see, why do I respond this way? Maybe it has something to do with my parents. Maybe it has something to do with the way I was raised or wasn't raised. We want to know that. We have an innate nature to know that. That's why I think even non-Christians are desperate to know origin. And we're going to the far reaches of the universe to figure it out. And we're spending billions and billions of dollars to figure out our origin. And did anybody see the pictures coming back from Pluto? I, I, um, I got one here. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, we got some, <laughs> hey, some concerns about the, uh, what's being built out there. Um, if you don't know, that's the Death Star. Um, we are spent um, the CERN laboratories over in uh, Switzerland, in Germany, is billions and billions of dollars in research trying to recreate. Uh, the beginnings of uh, the universe and uh, electron colliders and uh, we are desperate to fi figure out our origin because it says something about our identity. Why am I here? Purpose and meaning. That's the big question. The mean what's the meaning of life? <coughs> There's ways to answer that question and I think you're, you want to know the answers to that question. Why am I here? What's, what's the purpose? Um, there certainly has to be more than paying the bills and retiring in Florida, whatever. <laughs> Going to family. There's got to be something more to life than this. There's, and this gives me purpose and meaning. So you look at the two different worldview options that we have, and both are belief systems, by the way. It's not like one's based on fact and one's based on religion or theory. Uh, they're both belief systems. And then where am I going when I die. Happy thought, right? What's next? Because really, that's, we need to know that. If nothing is next, then it doesn't matter so much how I live my life. If something is next, if there's heaven and hell, and the way I live here or decisions that I make here determine where I spend eternity, then it affects my life now. That's why these things matter. These bookends matter because it determines my identity, it determines my purpose and meaning as I move towards my eternal destination. So I would encourage you, if you get nothing out of this day and tomorrow, spend time, chapters one through three, and spend time in the last three chapters of Revelation, 20, 21, and 22. Read those, and in fact, I would read them together. It's, it's amazing the similarities between those two. So we're going to look at those. We're going to look at some of that right now. Where did I come from? How do you answer this question from a naturalistic worldview? The Big Bang and Darwinian evolution are the most accepted theories out there right now, although both are facing criticism from the scientific community. Right now, the Big Bang Theory is in question by mathematicians and astrophysicists. Uh, there was an article in February in the New York Times um, that said the Big Bang Theory is, there's too many unanswered questions. Uh, when it was proposed in the, in the 50s, um, they were hoping that they would find more, as they researched more and more out into our galaxy and even down into set, at the cellular level, level they were expecting to find more and more evidence for the Big Bang Theory. What they're finding is less and less evidence for it. And so mathematicians are now proposing this concept that the universe did not have a beginning. This is the newest theory. Which is trouble for somebody like Hugh Ross, which is a, a Christian a theistic evolutionist. He calls it progressive creationism. He is struggling now because he built a lot of his theories on the Big Bang. If the Big Bang goes away as a theory, which it's going to take years for that to happen, he's going to have to adjust his theory because I, I believe, my opinion is, Hugh Ross and others like him have drifted from 
the biblical account, and they have to constantly modify. This was written in 2009. If the Big Bang goes away, he's going to have to modify his theory. The beautiful thing about Scripture, I've never had to modify my theory. I continue to learn. I continue to understand. But I don't have to, no matter what the new scientific, if they find water on Pluto, that doesn't shake a thing about this theory. Okay? I don't have to modify anything. If the Big Bang goes away, it's not built on man's theory. This is built on God's Word. This is what I want to continue to bring you back to. They don't know. There's no textbook, there's no scientist, there's no Darwinian evolutionist that will say affirmatively or affirmatively or authoritatively, this is how we began. They always use question, questions and um, we assume, uh, we're hoping, we, we're, we think. Uh, there's nothing authoritative on this question, where did I come from? Lots of theories, nothing authoritative. In fact, I want you to know this. I've read The Origin of the Species by right? Charles Darwin. He says nothing about origins. Do you know that? His theory, I believe, was hijacked by this group, and they took his theory of change of species and extra tried to extrapolate it back to, to get rid of God. Uh, they hijacked his work. I don't think this is biblical, by the way, but it certainly wasn't. didn't say anything about origins. He only talks about the origin of species and the, and the change of species. So that's been that's been on that. We don't have much from the naturalistic worldview on origins. Nothing solid, nothing provable. Uh, it's it's belief. They have to take it on faith, just like we take on faith God's word. In fact, uh, the latest Creation Magazine answers in Genesis said there are still three puzzles that evolution and um, the Big Bang theory cannot explain. These are the problems, and this is why they keep adjusting the theory. Life from non-life cannot be explained. They can't do it. They can't recreate in the laboratory, even with all of their work, information of life, Let's say I had a computer, like the one that's running this machine. I had all of the physical parts of the computer. I had the memory card. I had the tower. I don't even know what's in here. All this stuff. <laughs> it, is a war it is a paperweight. In fact, I have an iPad right now I call it paperweight. It stopped working. It has no information on it, or its, it's information is inaccessible. The information of life is what makes it work. When, in, uh, According to information theory, information has to come from an information giver. There has to be a programmer. There has to be a, uh, somebody putting the information into the machine. So even if there's the cellular structure for life, they can't explain where the information for life came from. There's not a, um, a way for that to happen. Even with information theory, let's say you you're transferring pictures from your camera to your computer. Information theory says whenever that gets disrupted, there's always a loss of information. There's typically, if you, if you have some sort of trouble getting your pictures from your camera to your computer, you don't open up your computer and see that there's five extra pictures that you didn't take. <laughs> Usually it's the file was corrupt and you can't see anything. There's a loss of information when there's transfer. So similarly, when we look at DNA transfer of information, when there's a disruption in that or a mutation, it's typically a loss of information. Things aren't, it's not, a, it's not a beneficial mutation. So there's a lot of things with information of life that they have, have trouble or cannot explain. Irreducible complexity, that you can't get lower than what makes it, all the pieces that it takes to make it work. Read about it. I love that stuff, but I don't have time for it today. So what does God say? Where did we come from? Let's get to the good stuff. Genesis chapter 1. Open up your Bible. I'll put it on the screen. For people like Jeff that didn't bring Bible. <laughs> and 
Ken, will you write some things on the board over there? I just want to look at this. We'll go through this. This was a week-long seminar I did at, um, for chapel at a school down in Texas. We're going to do it in about five minutes. I want to look at just, I just want you to see this. Um, the beauty of scripture. This is NIV. You can, you can mark this or read it in your own version. I want to just ask you a few questions about this as we read this together. What what are seven things that we could pull out, and there's many more, but let's, I think I put seven out there, we'll see if we can get all seven. That Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and maybe into 3, tell us about God. Yes? He created the heavens. Okay, so let's start with these first three words. In the beginning, God. What does that tell us about God? He's already there. He was already there, which means God is eternal, right? That's the, that's the word. And it's funny that evolutionists are now grabbing onto this word that they've made fun of us for years about. God is eternal. If, if he started something in the beginning, he had to be there before the beginning. In the beginning, God created. What does that tell us about God? God is creative. Number two. You'll see why this is important in a minute. Question or next one? Another one. Never Do it. He's a spirit. Okay. He's not you're, like a, a hey, you're an getting, idol. He's a spirit. A spirit yes. Form. Okay. You're getting way ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going way slower than you. All right. Okay. We'll get there. He made something out of nothing. That's the part. Yes, stop. We're getting there. <laughs> just, I want to read the Bible. God created the heavens. What does that tell us about God? What do we know about the heavens? They go on forever. Pretty much. They're huge. If you've been to the Creation Museum and you've gone to that IMAX thing that they've got on the ceiling and they show you the heavens is unbelievably big and continuing to expand. Yes. Limitless. It's limitless. It's unbelievably big. So that tells me if God made that, God is big. God is incredibly big. That's is that number three or four? God created. He's creative. God is big. Let me just show you. This got so many different. There's a picture. Oh, yeah. So here's just our galaxy, and there are billions of these, and they're discovering them more and more every day. And when you go to the Creation Museum, you realize when we look up in the star, star sky and see a star. Oftentimes, we're seeing an, an entire galaxy that's so far away and it's, that has billions of stars in that galaxy. This is just ours. God is big. Where is the Earth? In the galaxy. The Earth is in the heavens, right? Why in Genesis... Why in Genesis does he say, and the earth? If it's, or if it's in the heavens, why do you think it points it out that he created the earth? Is he specifying our story? Specifying our story. And if you look at this picture, here's a picture of the earth. They call it the uh, pale blue dot. God, even though he's so big, he delights in small. Amen. And the insignificant. God delights in the small and the insignificant. That's 
this is in the first verse. And I don't know what, what that does for you, but to know that God, it's, it's one thing to, to wonder at the size of God. It's another thing to know that He cares about me. That's why this matters. Because if God cares about me and He wants a relationship with me, He's not just out there running the universe or He didn't just set things in motion and leave it alone. I believe, I want to believe in a God that wants to be involved in my life. And for Him, if He's running this universe to want to be involved in my life, that tells me something about the nature of God. That's the kind of God I want to serve. And I... I get to choose. He lets me choose what I believe. And I can ignore him. And I can live my life the way I want. I can shake my fist in his face. I can say, Thank you. Okay, sorry. Man, I didn't see that one coming. Um, <laughs> You get into this and you see God is spirit. There's a mystery. God's a mystery. We can put that one in there. I don't know what that means. It's formless and empty and over the surface of the deep and God's spirit was hovering over the waters. I don't know what all that means. There's some things that I want to I want to know that. I want to learn those things. I want to figure out what I can on this earth and look forward to heaven when I can get these questions answered. Verse 3, God said, let there be light. God spoke, and there was light. God is powerful. When you can speak something, and things happen, and things are created out of nothing, somebody mentioned that, that's power. God has incredible power and authority that creation responds to His voice. That's why John says the Word was in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. His Word is powerful. And we have it. And it has power in our lives. And there was light. God saw the light was good. God is good. He's a good God. And you see that throughout the creation story. He separated the light from darkness. God brings order. How many of you, God has brought some order to your life? As you've learned to follow His ways. God is an orderly God. He's methodical. He's, he's also... Spontaneous. We see some spontaneity. I think creating this world was kind of a crazy thing for him to do. Some people ask, why did you, know, did you do it? If you knew how it was going to end up, I don't know. There's spontaneity there, but there's also order. He separated the light from darkness. He called the light day. He named it. When you name something, you name your kid, you name your dog, you give it meaning, you give it purpose. <laughs> I'm not equating those two. <laughs> Ask me which one I'd rather spend the day with. <laughs> God 